Wonderful. I uh, d delighted that uh, Heidi's invited me back, uh, especially after yesterday. So, <laughs> always good to know that uh, you made a good impression. Now, if you were here yesterday, and I think about 20% of you may have been, there is going to be a little overlap between some of the content of yesterday and this morning. That is of necessity. Most of the people here this morning were not here yesterday, so that would be new information to them. But nevertheless, it'll be presented in a different format, and it's also going to be much more detailed. The first presentation is going to speak directly to the theory of ADHD as an executive disorder. And in doing so, we are going to go deeply into the neuroanatomy of this disorder, because if you understand what we know now about the neuroanatomical basis of this disorder, you can then walk from there into the neuropsychology of the disorder and what we would expect to see if these particular neural networks were somehow delayed or disrupted developmentally. And I think that's going to give us a much better insight into understanding the nature of this disorder and then into its management. So I have a, uh, a tough row to hoe, to borrow an agricultural phrase, and uh, a lot to cover this morning. So I'm going to ask that you keep your hands down. There will be time for questions at the end of this presentation before the coffee break. And then in following the coffee break, I will speak more directly about the major life impairments of adult ADHD and what we recommend people try to do about them. So that's going to be a very clinical and applied discussion. This is going to be more theoretical and neuroanatomical. The last person to hear this speech said it was like sitting in front of a fire hydrant with the valve open as terms of the amount of information that was coming out of it. So hopefully that was a good thing, not a bad thing, but uh, we'll see. I want to begin with the neuroanatomy of the disorder because this has been a rapidly advancing field along with molecular genetics so that we now understand ADHD to be among the top three neurogenetic disorders in psychiatry, contrary to yesterday's Toronto Star, which interviewed a graduate student in medical history who claimed that this is a myth, a social construct. If it's a myth, it's got some very good neuroanatomy behind it. So we have so much research in the neurological basis of ADHD that just a few months ago, Steve Frohn actually conducted a meta-analysis, which requires that there be numerous studies available and that the results of these studies are then combined mathematically into an overarching meta-analysis of the field. And that review concluded that there are five neuroanatomical networks, or structures rather, that appear to be involved in this disorder. What we know is that in at least two-thirds to three-quarters of all ADHD cases, these would be the genetic cases, that these brain regions appear to be somewhat smaller, about 3 to 10 percent on average, smaller than they should be in their development. Now, that is not enough for individuals to be able to use any sort of neuroimaging device for diagnosis. Dan Amen cannot do this, doesn't matter what he says. Cerebral blood flow studies, functional MRI studies, PETs and so forth are of no use diagnostically because the differences we are looking for are so small as to overlap substantially with the variation in brain size in the normal population. Now, brain functioning is a little bit more promising. Here we find that anywhere from 10 to 15 percent to as much as 25 percent less brain activity within these regions. But even there, we have found it difficult to identify neurological measures such as QEEG or functional MRI or PET that might be useful for detecting these altered brain functions. So suffice to say that while there is a clear neurological underpinning to the disorder, it is not so stunning that one could look at each individual scan and say yes or no, this person would have ADHD. The differences are subtle. They are developmental differences, and you have to average together 50 or more scans to be able to pick up the ADHD normal distinction in these studies. So let's understand that while the neuroanatomical basis of ADHD is very well established, that does not mean you can immediately crosswalk into clinical diagnosis and use these devices for diagnostic purposes. Now, the five structures of the brain that are implicated in this disorder are interconnected, so it's not as if they're independent. If one is smaller, we would expect to see that across the entire network would be smaller as well. And we're going to take a closer look at these structures. The first of them, of course, is the frontal cortex. 
but not the entire frontal cortex, which occupies nearly a third of the front part of the human brain, as I'll show you in a moment, but principally the dorsolateral orbital aspect of the frontal cortex, which is just above the eyebrows and transferring over to the lateral or exterior side of the brain. And most research places it more in the right hemisphere than the left hemisphere. So the right orbital frontal cortex seems to be more implicated. Now, that is connected back into a structure known as the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is where the nerve cells from the frontal cortex terminate, and this structure is involved in motor execution and inhibition for the most part. Tourette's syndrome originates in this structure, and we see a release of inhibition of obsessive, compulsive, and uh, other ritualistic mannerisms as a result of a disturbance in this structure. Now, the third structure implicated is the cerebellum. And we know that the basal ganglia projects further back into the central part of this very, very old brain. The cerebellum has been around for millions of years through various other species that were our ancestors. It's a very primitive structure that has to do with the timing and the grace and the timeliness of our motor movements. But we also know that in humans, it is extraordinarily important for higher cognitive activity, for thinking, because it plays as much role in the timing and grace and transition and sequencing of our thoughts as it does in our actions. So the cerebellum is not just a principally motor organ. It is involved in thinking as well. But as I'll show you, there's a good reason for that because at some point we will discuss how thinking is simply private action, private behavior that is being retained in the brain rather than released into the spinal cord. But more on that later. Now, the third structure, which has only more recently been implicated, and which, while not necessarily smaller, is dramatically less active in people with ADHD, particularly adults, is the anterior cingulate. And I'll show you where that's located. It's right on the midline between the two hemispheres, somewhat deep inside the frontal cortex. And we'll have a diagram of that for you in just a moment. The anterior cingulate can be split into two regions, and we'll talk about both of those and what they do, because it will help us better understand the symptoms that ADHD uh, is producing. And then finally, sort of a throwaway region in the brain, if you will, is the corpus callosum. This is the part of the brain in which the two hemispheres project to each other so that they can communicate with each other, and it's principally the front part of the corpus callosum. But that's not surprising because if the frontal cortex is smaller, there are fewer projections to send into the other hemisphere, and therefore the corpus callosum would be smaller as well. So there's nothing exciting about that. Now, we have been able to show that the size of this network is directly related to the severity of a person's ADHD. So this is not hypothetical. We know this is the network. We know this is the ADHD part of the brain. Uh, and we know that when this part of the brain functions normally, it is the part that basically allows us to stop and think before we act. So it involves both the stopping and the thinking that is going to be going on before an act is finally chosen to be enacted. So it's the, if you will, self-regulatory part of the brain. Now, there are some gender differences, particularly during adolescence, in these brain structures, but they are relatively trivial for our purposes. We see these both in men and women, and uh, I don't want to gloss over them too much, but for the purposes of our lecture this morning, we need not go into these relatively trivial differences. Serial developmental neuroimaging studies have shown that this network remains smaller into late adolescence, but then begins to normalize in brain size by young adulthood. But because the structure is normalizing does not mean that the function of these areas is also normalizing. It isn't. So we have to be careful here that because some research is finding eventually that brain size appears to be approaching normal. It doesn't mean that what those areas are doing have achieved normalcy in their function as well. But it's about a two to three year lag in brain growth that is identified in these regions. Now, we have to, I think, take a moment and distinguish the fact that 
at least a third of ADHD, particularly in males, is not of the genetic variety. It is acquired. And this set of ADHD individuals, the acquired ADHD cases, may be somewhat different from the genetic cases. At the moment, our research is not so overwhelming that we can make extraordinary, numerous, and definitive statements. But let me just give you a few of the things that we have found so far that distinguish these two groups. The acquired group appears to be more severe. <clears throat> and we find that with all acquired injuries, acquired aphasia is much more severe than developmental language disorders tend to be. It may be that the acquired group is much less responsive to medications for ADHD, the difference being about 70 to 90 percent of genetic ADHD is drug sensitive, but 50 percent or less of acquired ADHD is so. But this makes sense. In the developmental case, the area of the brain where the medication can work is not damaged, destroyed, or scarred. There is a place for drugs to function. But in the acquired cases, they may well be damage, lesions, scarring, <clears throat> which will interfere with the capacity of the drug to act in that region, and therefore would predict that there would be markedly lower drug responding. Now, it may also be, besides this difference in drug response, that there may be differences in response to psychosocial treatments. No one has examined this. But if we look elsewhere in neuropsychology, for instance, as I've mentioned, the field of the aphasias that are acquired, say, from a stroke versus developmental language disorders. If we look at that particular disorder, the language disorders, we find that the acquired group is much more responsive to rehabilitation, particularly if it occurs in the months following the injury. <clears throat> Whereas the likelihood of developmental language disorders Showing, showing such a marked response to intervention is quite low. Indeed, the success of language interventions for developmental language disorder is rather sporadic and nowhere near as convincing as is language therapy for the acquired language disorders. People treat them as if they were synonymous. They're not. So that doesn't mean that developmental language disorders don't respond at all to linguistic interventions, to speech interventions. They do, but they don't respond anywhere near as dramatically as the acquired cases. Now, we don't know whether this extends into adult ADHD or child ADHD, but we do know that in other areas where we compare acquired versus developmental disorders, we do see differences in treatment responses in them. There may be differences in life course. We don't know that yet. <clears throat> other differences as well, such as in impairment. But suffice to say, in the future, researchers will begin to distinguish the type of ADHD based on its etiology. The genetic, non-genetic distinction appears to be a crude one, but perhaps a useful one at the moment. Now, we do know that these are not the result of taking stimulant medication, that this underdevelopment and this marked underactivity is not, contrary to Scientology claims, is not a result of giving medication to children. When these first neuroimaging studies appeared, critics in the media were quick to point out that they could just as easily be due to giving medication to children and that stimulants shrank the brain, and therefore we had caused these problems. Fortunately, researchers went back and repeated all of these studies with people who had never taken stimulant medication and found exactly the same results. So we can dismiss, once again, the Scientologist claims about ADHD. Now, let's take a few moments and look at where these brain structures are, in case you're not familiar with them. We're looking here at the frontal cortex, which is huge. It is this entire front third of the human brain. But the area we are most interested in is right up front here, particularly on the right side, and especially where the frontal cortex sweeps down and under and then goes back and sits on a bone shelf just above the eyes. This is the orbital frontal cortex, and it's located, let me see if I can get this cursor back, right in here where you see that arrow. And this area of the brain projects up and back to the prefrontal lateral cortex up in here. The right frontal area of the brain is known as an inhibitory center. <clears throat> 
This is where the ability to suppress behavior and to keep it suppressed seems to originate. And that allows the rest of the frontal cortex, which is where the thinking takes place, where what we hold in mind is going on, it, to take over the guidance of behavior. But absent this inhibitory area, whatever you're holding in mind is of no consequence. Your behavior will be impulsive. Now, the next structure we're interested in, actually there are two here, there are projections from this part of the brain, in fact, all over the frontal cortex, back onto the basal ganglia, which is this structure. The basal ganglia is actually three separate structures. Whoops, and all of them are smaller in people with ADHD. But the one most important for our purposes is known as the striatum, which is the C-like structure. Again, let me bring up the cursor right here. This C-like structure that you see on the outside, and notice how thick it is at the front. And that's because as the frontal cortex evolved in humans and underwent a massive expansion over the course of primate evolution, the striatum had to follow suit and expand right along with it because this is where cells from the frontal lobe terminate. This is where what you think is going to guide what you do. But more importantly, as I will show later, it is likely that this striatum has become a switching system in humans. It determines whether what we think about becomes something we do or whether it simply stays private within the head as something we contemplate but don't execute. Somewhere, as we will see in the brain, there has got to be a switch that determines the public self from the private self. As Jacob Pranowski, the great polymath in Britain, who was the author of The Ascent of Man back in the 1970s, but an extraordinary scientist and mathematician. As he once said, humans are the only primate that have two selves. We have a public self which we show to others, and it is displayed in our external behavior, that which we release into the spinal cord and the peripheral skeletal system. But we also have a private self that other primates don't seem to have, at least not to the degree that we do. We engage in a series of actions in our mind, and we do not release those thoughts to the public. We have a private self and a public self. So somewhere there is a switch, and that switch is going to become increasingly important in trying to understand ADHD, because what ADHD appears to be is a broken switching system, probably something to do with this striatum, which therefore means that thinking is being expressed publicly. ADHD results in people thinking out loud. There is no private simulation of what one hopes to do. It is up, out, and done. So one way of thinking of ADHD as a broken switch in this public-private network. Behavior we keep to ourselves and do not show to others and behavior that we elect to effortfully, willfully display. Somewhere there is a switch that distinguishes those two, and I think the best candidate is the basal ganglia. Why? Because when Tourette syndrome occurs, which is a gross disturbance in this structure, behaviors are released whether you want them to or not. Ticks, movements, thoughts, obscenities, compulsions, rituals, regardless of what the individual wishes to do, cannot suppress these behaviors, and they will become public. And that is because the system is broken at a very deep level of the basal ganglia, and they cannot suppress them anymore. Now, the next structure we are interested in is also up in the frontal lobe, and it is between the two hemispheres. And it's located right about where that arrow is located, but you can't see it because it's on the walls between the two hemispheres. And this is the anterior cingulate, about which I will have much more to say in a moment. And then as we look toward the back part of the brain, that very old brain, the primitive brain, is the cerebellum. And it is mainly in this area of the cerebellum that we see underdevelopment. Now, that's rather interesting because studies now have shown that family members of people who have ADHD, ADHD was in my family, that when we look at the parents and at the siblings of people with ADHD, we also see underdevelopment in most of these regions, but not in all of them. 
which means that this underdevelopment is part of the family phenotype of ADHD. ADHD is a spectrum disorder, and biological relatives of affected patients do show some symptoms of ADHD, but not the full disorder. This is very much like autistic spectrum disorders in that sense, where we see elements of autistic-like symptoms, but not full disorder or diagnosable disorder in those individuals. What has been fascinating has been the work of the UCLA research team, Jim McGough, Jim McCracken, and others, that have shown that when we look at the relatives of people with ADHD, the frontal lobe, the anterior cingulate, the basal ganglia are also smaller, even though the people don't have the disorder. The difference is the cerebellum. The affected patients have the underdevelopment in the cerebellum. The non-affected family members do not suggesting that the cerebellum may actually be the most crucial structure in explaining why the disorder rises to full disorder, penetrating the phenotype and becoming diagnosable ADHD. Now, that research needs to be replicated, but a similar finding has recently been published in the field of autism, where, again, family members show autistic-like symptoms, but full disorder seems to have something to do with the involvement of the cerebellum. So this isn't the only disorder in which the cerebellum has become more and more important. All right, we have these five brain regions. Who cares? What does it mean? All right? The fact that we can pinpoint in the brain what might be giving rise to these symptoms, does that help us understand this disorder any better? Or does it just make us feel better because we can point to biology rather than sociology? as the cause of ADHD. Well, let me explain why, if you understand what these networks do, you can start to understand ADHD a heck of a lot better. And one of the foremost ideas that people need to understand, and it's displayed beautifully here in this particular paper, this is the organization of the cortex. And what you see here is a front-to-back, rostral-to-caudal, top-down organization of the brain, which means that our thoughts, our highest plans, are located up here, and then these will be translated into smaller behavioral structures back in here. These will then be translated into the secondary motor zone and become the actions and gestures we actually execute, and those will project right on to the primary motor zone, which is located right in here, to actually create the muscle movements for that behavior. There is a top-down, front-to-back, rostral-caudal organization of the frontal cortex. The higher the level of thinking and planning, the more forward that is being done. The more molecular aspects of behavior, the sequences we will string together, are occurring further back. And the further back you go, the more minute and molecular the behavioral structures become. The further forward you go, the more hierarchically organized behavior becomes. We can see that here in a behavioral structure. This is taking money, going to the bank, and depositing the money in a safe deposit box. That is a higher order structure of behavior. But it can be broken down into the sequence you see on the left, and especially into two different structures of behavior that involve picking up the money and putting it in the box and involve the actual opening and closing of the, excuse me, of the locked box itself. Two separate overlapping hierarchies. And they are hierarchies because you can see here that we can split them, excuse me, for some reason. We can see here that we can split them into their two behavioral sequences nested under the larger purpose, the goal. What are we trying to do? Then we translate it into its sub-goals. We translate those sub-goals into much smaller behavioral structures, and we execute those in a sequence. So this ability to go from higher level to lower level behavior and to sequence it properly is a function of the prefrontal lobe. This is why we have it. This is what it does. If you want to think of something even bigger, plan a wedding. <laughs> Break that one down into its substructures, 
and then it's to its nested, even more molecular activities, all the way down to picking up the phone, calling the minister, then lining up the florist, then lining up the church, then lining up the invitations and the printer, and so on. And underneath each of those is going to be a whole series of even smaller actions and gestures, all building toward the culmination of a future goal. If you understand that, you now know why you have a frontal lobe. <clears throat> it's also illustrated here. I'm not going to spend much time on it because we've already discussed it, but the higher goals are retained at the foremost part of the frontal lobe. They will then be translated into their substructures, and those are translated in even further back as we move into the more minute actions that we do. What does this mean for ADHD? It means you cannot organize behavior as well as other people into these larger, hierarchically organized and temporally sequenced structures. Individuals with ADHD will find themselves able to engage in a couple of the minor sequences, but the structure is lost, the goal is shattered, the behavior is not fully executed, and the goal is either not attained or poorly attained because one cannot organize, one cannot glue together all of these substructures to attain these higher level functions. And this is where you get your short attention span. The short attention span is simply the fact that you can engage in these smaller structures, but you can't organize them into those larger and larger goals and be able to protect it and sustain it and carry it forward until the goal is done. So understanding the neuroanatomy of ADHD helps us to understand the behavioral symptoms of ADHD and this inability to hierarchically organize long chains of behavior to accomplish our goals. We can now define ADHD as a disorder of persistence toward the future, which is also deeply affected by a, res a failure to resist distraction. The individual cannot help responding to irrelevant events that lie outside of these behavioral structures, and the structure falls apart. Because the moment you are trying to engage the sequence, something else irrelevant happens, and you are responding to that. And the goal is lost, the sequence fails, and now you've only done part of the task and failed to engage the entire task. So we can now say that this is not an attention disorder. This is a problem with persistence toward the future, with the ability to hierarchically organize behavior into ever larger structures to accomplish the principal goals of our lives, the important things that lie ahead in the future in time. That instead, you will have marked difficulties resisting distractions, and that will shatter this working memory function as we've described it, this hierarchy of behavior, and now you are skipping from one incompleted sequence to another, hence the short attention span and the marked distractibility. And even when distracted, the patient with ADHD is going to find it very difficult to re-engage the uncompleted task or goal because they can't hold all of this in mind anymore. Once the distraction occurs, working memory, which is up here, is shattered, the goal is lost, and the person is off to the races. Whatever else happens in the moment will be more compelling than the goal they had held in mind. So patients with ADHD will not re-engage in completed activities the way other people would have done had they been interrupted and had to deal with a compelling distraction. Other people get back to work, finish the task, see the goal to its final completion. The patient with ADHD is far less likely to do so. Now that is a function of working memory, as I have said which suggests that ADHD is not an attention disorder. It's a disorder of at least working memory. And since working memory, as we will show, is one of the major executive abilities, it implies that the other executive abilities must be at risk also, which therefore means that ADHD, especially in adults, is an executive function disorder, not an attention deficit disorder. Now, DSM-5 will not change the name no matter how much you plead with them even though we know that ADHD is a misnomer, and we know that it trivializes these profound impairments in these relatively unique human abilities. 
And the reason we will not do so is for a very good reason. The term ADHD now appears in both of our countries in laws, regulations, entitlements, and protections, especially in the United States. And if you rename a disorder, you have just disenfranchised these individuals from those hard-won protections and entitlements. So we won't rename the disorder, if only because of legal political reasons, even though the science is telling us that the name is inappropriate, if not trivial. In fact, I think that the name is part of our problem in convincing the public that there is a real disorder here. Because attention deficit really does sound rather banal, doesn't it? I mean, just go to Starbucks, have a coffee, get some caffeine, would you? We got serious disorders to contend with. I mean, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, major depression. Now, those sound impressive. But ADHD, pfft, get out of here, you know? We got serious mental disorders to deal with. But if you were to rephrase ADHD as executive function deficit disorder, and if you know that the executive system exists to organize behavior across time, to allow you to self-regulate toward that future, you could call ADHD either EFDD or SRDD, self-regulation deficit disorder. Now that's an impressive name because it speaks to something uniquely human, and that is self-regulation. So you need to know that regardless of what DSM-5 does with the name, and it will not change it, I can assure you of that, that we as patients, as clinicians, as family members, need to understand that we have changed the nature of this disorder, that we now have a much better insight into what's going wrong, and it ain't attention. It's executive functioning.